Hello, everyone. My name is Devin O'Brien. I'm a third year cardiac surgery resident at the University of Alberta. I'm originally from St. John, New Brunswick, and recently finished a rotation at the New Brunswick Heart Centre and was asked to do a quick presentation for nursing education on pacing wires and pacemakers. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So for an outline of what we'll discuss today, uh, we'll go through a quick introduction and some basic terminology. Uh, the diagnostic and therapeutic uses of pacing wires and pacemakers, uh, pacing nomenclature, pacing and when to use what type, some potential problems you could encounter, and a little bit about permanent pacemakers at the end of the presentation. So to begin, for every heartbeat, electrical signals travel through the conduction pathway of your heart. The parts of the cardiac conduction system are the sinoatrial, or SA node, the atrioventricular, or AV node, the bundle of his, and the Purkinje fibers. Here's a diagram of the cardiac conduction system, and it displays all the parts of the conduction system that we just went over and the typical locations in the heart. Uh, during cardiac surgery, there's many times that the cardiac conduction system can potentially be damaged um, or have inflammatory processes postoperatively that can lead to issues with pacing. The conduction pathway starts when the SA node creates an excitation signal. This signal then travels to the atria, telling them to contract. It then goes to the atrioventricular node, where the signal is delayed until your atria are empty of blood. Then it travels to the bundle of his, carrying the signal to the Purkinje fibers. The Purkinje fibers then carry the signal to your ventricles, causing them to contract. For some general information, the use of cold cardioplegic arrest is commonly associated with temporary sinus node or AV node dysfunction. Placement of temporary atrial and or ventricular wires are beneficial to many patients for hemodynamic optimization post-op cardiac surgery. Wires are useful when medications to prevent atrial fibrillation cause AV heart block and hesitancy to pace atrial wires may come from experience with bleeding when pulling a wires. That can sometimes happen on the floor when pacing wires are pulled uh, and a wires are more likely the source of those circumstances when tamponade becomes an issue. Some surgeons because of this have a little bit of hesitancy placing atrial wires in the first place. For some diagnostic uses, so atrial electrograms when the nature of the arrhythmia cannot be confirmed by 12 lead ECG, atrial pacing wires can be used to obtain atrial electrograms. These atrial electrograms can distinguish between atrial and junctional arrhythmias and differentiate them from more, life, from more life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. For therapeutic uses, so optimal hemodynamics is a very important therapeutic use. Postoperatively, the heart rate is of approximately 90 beats per minute tends to be best, and we can use pacing wires to obtain this instead of chronotropic agents that have varying other myocardial effects. And atrial or AV pacing typically produces better hemodynamics than ventricular pacing alone. AV delays many times prolong postoperatively, uh, and shortening this using pacing wires can improve hemodynamics. Another therapeutic use would be termination of reentrant rhythms. So rapid atrial pacing can terminate type 1 atrial flutter and other paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias. And rapid ventricular pacing can terminate VT. Obviously, uh, in these circumstances, it would be a very short-term use of pacing, uh, but nonetheless can be very useful. To move on to some pacing nomenclature, uh, so here you can see that there's coded positions, one through five. Uh, one through three is typically what you would hear about. So I'll just go over them here. Um, for number one, that would be the chamber paste. So O would be none, A would be atrium, V ventricle, D dual, and S single chamber. Two would be the chamber sensed. Uh, and again, the same nomenclature below. Three is the response to sensing, so O would be none, T would be triggers pacing, I inhibits pacing, and D triggers and inhibits pacing. In four, that's programmability uh, or rate response, uh, 
So O is none, R is rate responsive, P is simple programmable, M is multi-programmable, and C is communicating. And finally, for the fifth code position, anti-tachyarrhythmia functions, O is none, P is anti-tachycardia pacing, S is shock, and D is dual pace and shock. For temporary pacing modes used after heart surgery, um, as I said, you'll typically hear of the three first code positions. So here you can see a list of five different, uh, different combinations of those. So AOO would be asynchronous atrial pacing, AAI would be atrial demand pacing, VVI would be ventricular demand pacing, DVI, AV sequential pacing with ventricular demand, and DDD, AV sequential pacing with both chambers sensing. The most common modes are AOO, uh, VVI, DVI, and DDD. Here you can see the temporary pacing box uh, that you would see commonly in CBICU and up on the ward, um, where you can change the heart rate, uh, the voltage, and the sensitivity, which we'll go through here. So for pacing, effective cardiac pacing requires the timed introduction of an electrical impulse, which depolarizes nearby myocardium, leading to propagation of an activation wavefront. Capture, when we talk about that, what we're saying is the successful, that successful pacing has occurred. For stimulation or pacing threshold, that means the minimum energy required to produce capture. Pacing energy threshold is a function of the voltage delivered by each electrical impulse and the time duration over which the impulse is delivered. And as a margin of safety um, for chronic pacing leads, it's conventionally programmed at a pacing output two times uh, the pacing threshold voltage or three times pacing threshold pulse width, width. And that's just to make sure that we're being extra safe, um, that there will be no issues. For sensing, Sensing is required for the pacemaker to coordinate pacing with any intrinsic electrical cardiac activity or depolarization. The electrogram is sensed when the amplitude of an electrical signal exceeds the program sensing threshold. When sensing occurs, the program timing circuits of the pulse generator are reset. In general, a, again, a two-fold to three-fold sensing safety margin is incorporated to reduce the incidence of over-sensing. And what becomes somewhat confusing is the lower the setting, the more sensitive the pacemaker is to intracardiac signals. For pacing and when to use what? So to begin with, atrial pacing requires the ability to capture atrium and normal AV node conduction. It's ineffective during AFib, A flutter, and it's accomplished in AOO or AAI mode, usually at 10 to 20 milliamps and set to a rate faster than the heart rate. So indications for atrial pacing and when we would want to use that are sinus bradycardia um, or, a desire, or a desire to increase the sinus rate, suppression of PVCs, set at a rate faster than the sinus mechanism, suppression of PACs or prevention of AFib, a slow junctional rhythm, or overdriving SVT, so that could be a flutter, proxismal atrial or AV junctional reentrant tachycardia. Uh, rapid atrial pacing can interrupt a reentrant circuit and convert it to a sinus rhythm or a non-sustained rhythm, such as AFib, which may terminate spontaneously. For atrioventricular pacing, so AV pacing is ineffective during atrial fibrillation flutter. AV pacing is preferable to ventricular pacing uh, because atrial contraction helps cardiac output. So for indications of AV pacing, they would be complete heart block, second degree heart block to achieve one-to-one -one conduction, or first degree heart block if one-to-one -one conduction cannot be achieved at a faster rate because of a long PR interval. For ventricular pacing, so of note, ventricular pacing in VOO or VVI mode with undersensing of native R wave may result in delivery of an inappropriate spike on T wave causing ventricular tachyarrhythmia. So this can be a very serious issue 
where you're sending someone into uh, ventricular tachycardia based on the settings that you've chose for the temporary pacemaker. So while they can help us in many instances, we need to be sure that we understand all of the different settings and what we're doing when we're changing the settings to make sure that negative consequences don't occur as well. For ventricular pacing indications, slow ventricular response to atrial fibrillation flutter, failure of atrial pacing to maintain heart rate, and ventricular tachycardia overdrive in pacing. So some potential problems that you may encounter. Um, a big one and probably one of the main ones would be failure to function. So the, pay, the temporary pacemaker not working. Um, so this can be through faulty connections, uh, which can be the pacing wires to the connecting cord or to the generator, a defective pacing cord, electrodes located in an area of poor electrical content or high threshold on the heart, undetected detachment of the wires, or undetected development of atrial fibrillation causing failure of capture. So if this occurs, how to fix failure to function? So first of all, you want to check all of your connections to make sure that they're connected. Uh, you can increase the output of the pulse generator. You can reverse the polarity of the wires. You can try unipolarizing the pacemaker by attaching positively to a surface ECG electrode or skin pacing wire. You can convert uh, ventricular pacing if atrial stimulus fails to produce capture. Uh, you can use chronotropic medications. You can place transvenous pacing wires or in a worst case scenario, you could transcutaneously pace for the time being. So some other issues that can arise, a change in threshold, and this can be caused due to edema, inflammation, thrombus, or scar tissue in the heart. Um, Oversensing. So if the atrial activity of AFib, A flutter is sensed during DDD pacing, a fast ventricular rate will be noted. Competition of native rhythm. So if atrial or ventricular ectopy during asynchronous pacing, uh, turning off pacemaker may eliminate this problem. Inadvertent triggering of VFVT. So ventricular pacing should always be done using DVI, VVI, or DDD. And the last issue would be mediastinal bleeding, which we had talked a bit about before. So several hours after removal of wires, we need to make sure that we observe these patients very carefully and don't send them home immediately after a wire pull to observe for tamponade because that's always a possibility when you pull the wires from the heart. Just a quick little section on permanent pacemakers. So post-operative management, or sorry, post-operative permanent pacemaker placement is indicated for the following. So if someone has continued complete heart block, if they're symptomatic or have significant sinus node dysfunction, if they have a slow ventricular response to atrial fibrillation, if they have tachycardia bradycardia syndrome, or if they have advanced second degree heart block with a slow ventricular response. And obviously, this would be a conversation with the electrophysiology specialist to see if the patient is in a situation where they feel they would need a permanent pacemaker um, for the rest of their lives to help with these issues. My resources for the presentation were the Manual of Perioperative Care and Adult Cardiac Surgery, the 5th edition by Robert Bojar. And again, as I said, my name is Devin O'Brien. I'm a third year cardiac surgery resident at the University of, Al University of Alberta. However, I can be reached by email if anyone has any questions about the presentation. Uh, my email is on the first slide of the presentation, uh, but I'll spell it out here. It's djobrie1 at ualberta.ca. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and learned something. Um, and hopefully you have a great day. Thank you.